yeah, anyway, uh, I, this, this was like introductory part, organizational part. But I will share something, uh, a part of conversation that we had with uh, my assistant Irina earlier today. And she said, Ilze, you need to talk about this. And maybe I will today. And that is about money. Uh, and the context was that uh, uh, my assistants helped me to reach out and uh, talk to people um, and bring them into the area of my awareness, who I could talk with uh, and reach out and talk about my business. And this is what, what it takes. If you want to be a business owner, you need to talk to people. You actually need to sell your services. And uh, at the beginning, it feels uncomfortable, but uh, you get used to it. And remember, I like this saying, remember this saying, uh, yeses live <clears throat> in the land of no's. So be prepared to hear no's uh, and then you will hear yeses as you reach out to, for, uh, to people and uh, invite them to collaborate with you or to buy things from you. Anyway, uh, we talked about the people who my assistant would uh, reach out to and start conversations with and then invite for conversations with me. And uh, she asked about uh, the country, countries where she could reach out, like where, where would that, those people be? And obviously, because I live in the United States, uh, I basically talk with people in the US. But my assistants, as I said, they uh, none of them are in the United States. Uh, they are in Latvia and Philippines. So uh, I said, uh, reach out to people uh, in the country that you understand, the culture that you understand, and uh, that's fine. And then we can talk. And uh, she said, but you know what? I think that uh, they will not uh, ever become your customers because uh, I don't think they will have money to buy from you. And this is where I think it got to me at that moment. And I told her my story, which happened even before I uh, got to know her. And I'm talking about my assistant, Irina. And I told her about how I paid a lot of money for my dream for my dreams and the biggest dream at that time was my education, my MBA degree. Uh, I lived in Latvia at that time and I lived in, I think it's safe to say in poverty because if you saw the conditions that I was in where I lived, um, I think you would agree with me and I will describe it a little bit. I lived in a, how you would call it, like a block of flats on a very tiny, small flat. Um, flat is like, like uh, an apartment, but very, with very small, tiny rooms. But that's, that's the, the, the size is not everything. Um, the condition, how the, the building was and all the setting. And I'll describe uh, it to you. It was, I feel even vulnerable to, uh, to think about it. It was a nine story building and I lived on the ground floor. And um, I had acquired that flat after my first divorce, because I was, I have been married three times. I actually uh, lost everything because of his um, economic um, activities. So I, I had to build everything from the scratch. That building was, the, the, the apartment in that building was everything that I could afford. And it wasn't much. I lived on the ground floor 
and the the building the 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 entrance door wouldn't lock and anybody who would be homeless and needed to sleep somewhere overnight would sleep there but not not just that sometimes people just wanted to go to the toilet and they would come and poop or pee right next to my door and i would be the one who would clean it up because i was on the first floor and i had even developed a method how to clean it up i would take you know the spray and just spray everything and and brush everything but sometimes when there was a poo you know i had to clean that up too so i would have like a shovel and then, then i would throw on um like a napkin and then just dump it and then i would have to wash that shovel you know and disinfect everything and this happened on a regular basis it wasn't a one-time thing and then in winter time i remember that it was cold and there's like that little glass basically it's it was um very dark but there was a little glass window at the entrance and people would have spat you know all that shit that comes out of your mouth green and that would freeze on the glass window and pregnant me would go and clean it all because i just didn't like living in a building like that and nobody else cleaned and then my neighbors from the ninth or eighth floor who were too lazy to take the garbage out would just dump the garbage in the shaft in the hallway and it would all uh, fall down on the ground floor where i lived and i would clean up that garbage and throw out uh, for everybody else that's how i lived and living there i had that big dream to um, get out of that situation and at that time there was a business school in Riga, Latvia, uh, that, where people could get an MBA degree. And I was just an English teacher at that time because I had studied English. And um, I thought that if I got that business degree, I would be able to have big business and, and more money and get out of that situation. So I decided to get into that MBA program and then there was uh, some examination where they selected people who would um, they would accept the program and I knew English quite well not everybody did at that time in Latvia so I passed English and I had had some business experience because I have been entrepreneurial uh, all my adult life I've always had some business going on so I had that conversation about uh, having a business and I got in and I studied in the program together with the biggest bank executives because that program was open only for the second year uh, of the, uh, while that school, that Swedish school was in Riga, Latvia. And there was a lot of pressure. I had to study a lot, really hard because I was among really smart, smart people. And uh, it was very stressful, uh, so stressful that I could barely sleep because I studied all the time just to catch up with everybody because there was a lot to learn. They already had uh, bachelor's degrees in business. I didn't, but I did it. I made it. I made through it. Um, but talking about the money side of it, uh, what it took from me, people thought that I was crazy. So this... Um bringing it back to the context where my uh, assistant Irina said that people in Latvia or Philippines or somewhere else in the world would not be able to pay for what I offer or any one of you offers if you are in the United States. Uh, I would say it's not true. There are people who would pay for your services for the highest uh, service they can get. It depends what you offer and if it resonates with that person who wants that service desperately, who wants that help desperately. Irina asked me, but you like how you probably had some source of 
income? How did you, how did you, how were you able to uh, afford it? And I said, I just took a loan. I took a loan. And she said, yeah, but how, how could you pay that loan back? And I said, I translated. I translated. That's what I did. That's what I knew how to do. And I had already pre-calculated how many pages a day I would have to translate in order to pay back the loan. And my rates were really low at that time. So I did it. I paid it all back. And some people who were my friends, they said I was crazy. They said, I would have bought a car for that money, a good car. And I said, you know what? I'll buy a car too. And two years after I, basically, um, after, right after I graduated from that MBA program, I bought a car. I bought not just a car, I bought a Lexus because I made that money. So what, what I, I want took to along. say is that um, have faith in yourself that you can achieve your dream, but also have faith in those people who you are serving. Don't underestimate them. There are people who will gladly pay for what you offer, for your value.